it, this was supposed to be the end of year video uh, before real life events overtook but hey it's the new year so let's do a new year video and I thought we'd do something a little bit special a historical account of a naval engagement has been done before and will be done again on this channel as they seem relatively popular but this time we thought let's go the extra mile I mean we've recently seen the channel grow substantially we're now a, a five figure subscriber level and we passed our hundredth guide recently and I've got literally years of content requests lined up thanks to all your comments and of course our ancestors ability to churn out warships like it was going out of fashion so today we're going to take a good long look at Operation Cerberus also known as the Channel Dash in a somewhat special format uh, let me know what you think and uh, the format might make an appearance again in the future for some other major battle narratives although it's not going to be obviously an everyday feature because this took a lot of work. Anyways, enough teasing. Uh, the Channel Dash, or as we said, Operation Cerberus, came about due to two independent missions. The mildly successful Operation Berlin in the spring of 1941, where both Scharnhorst class ships broke out into the Atlantic to raid convoys. They'd had some success, but also run into a couple of convoys escorted by Revenge and Queen Elizabeth class battleships, and had had to back off. With mechanical issues developing, they'd finished their mission by sailing into the occupied French port of Brest, which had some su substantial naval dockyard infrastructure which would allow the ships to be repaired. Late in 1941, the first, and last, voyage of the Bismarck, had left its accompanying heavy cruiser, the Prince Eugen, at something of a loose end. Developing engine troubles of her own, she had also managed to sneak into Brest for the same reasons. Partially thanks to everyone else being distracted by the Bismarck, and then having to head home for fuel, and so being unable to chase the Prince Eugen. The heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper had also wound up in a similar situation earlier in 1941, before the Scharnhorst's arrival, and despite five weeks of RAF bombing, had been able to head back out, do more damage, and then get home by a reverse route to that taken by the Bismarck later on. With tens of thousands of tons of shipping sunk by service raiders, the idea of Brest collecting and servicing raiding forces straight out into the Atlantic was understandably not a pleasant one to the British, who had formed Group 19, a division of coastal command with multiple reconnaissance squadrons and a few strike-capable units specifically to keep an eye on the port. Additionally, at this time, Winston Churchill directed the British war effort specifically at any German assets capable of being used against convoys, and so the Scharnhorst would be on the receiving end of over a thousand bomber missions in their first couple of months in port. Between bad weather and early war problems with accuracy, there were no direct hits, uh, but when Gneisenau was to have its dry dock pumped out for engine work in April, they found a large unexploded bomb sitting right under the ship, having missed it by the narrowest of margins and settled in the bottom of the dry dock during a night raid. Very gingerly, they refilled the dry dock, eased the ship out so they could defuse the device, but constant photo recon missions spotted that the ship was now temporarily out of dock and exposed whilst it was at anchor. And so the very next day, Beaufort torpedo bombers came racing in through the morning mist and managed to land a torpedo hit on the ship's starboard side although it was a fairly close run thing with the successful Beaufort exploding from a direct hit by heavy flak at pretty much the same moment the torpedo exploded. Gneisenor began to list heavily and in normal circumstances it might have been a fatal blow, but with salvage bo boats on hand the damage was brought under control successfully. The ship was then moved back into its dry dock, now with even more damage to fix, estimates reckoned about six months only for the weather to clear a bit, which resulted in the next RAF raid scoring four direct hits and two near misses. Luckily, one of the hits was a dud, but the others would jam the super-firing forward turret, warp the armoured deck, burn out about a third of the crew quarters, and damage the gunnery control systems. Most critical of all, the kitchens and the bakery were blown to pieces. A moment of silence, please. As this left the crew to subsist on local French cooking, 
without so much as a sausage or a sauerkraut leaf in sight. With this near war crime completed, the RAF then threw a few bombs at the Scharnhorst as well, missing, but managed to blow up various bits of dockside machinery that would further delay her refit. Between this and a backup raid that seeded the harbour with mines, there was no question of the ships being ready to support the Bismarck's voyage, so when Prince Eugen showed up, it was simply a case of get in line for the repairs. The summer of 1941 saw the Brest area turned into something of an experimental free-fire zone, as the RAF would test all sorts of new and inventive ways of blowing things up. New four-engined heavy bombers appeared periodically in small groups to try their luck, amongst other things, and in response the Germans installed hundreds of flat cannons of various sizes, along with artificial smoke generators, as well as relocating fighter squadrons for the purposes of defence. Inevitably, however, the bombers found their mark, and at the start of July a direct hit put Prince Eugen out of action for another three months. Scharnhorst, however, had been luckier and was finally operational again in late July, and promptly sailed further south to a harbour near La Rochelle for safety. The Germans didn't want to have months of hard work undone again in a single evening, and this also ruined a complicated RAF plan to swamp the port with bombs. However, the new four-engined heavy bombers also had the range to reach Scharnhorst's new home, and despite significant losses to flak and fighter defences, the RAF was bombing both ports within days. Scharnhorst would be hit five times in a neat line on the starboard side. Two hits were high-explosive bombs, and three were heavier armour-piercing weapons. Luckily for the Scharnhorst, none of them actually exploded, two of them passing right through the ship, and one leaving an interesting conundrum for the bomb disposal teams by fetching up deep inside the hull. But between the blast effects of the HE bombs and the holes left by the AP bombs, the ship was forced back to Brest's repair yards with 3,000 tonnes of unwanted water aboard and two-thirds of her main battery non-operational, along with about half the anti-aircraft battery. Although the ship and its escorts managed to down a torpedo bomber back on their way to Brest, thus avoiding even more problems. Several thousand more sorties would be flown, but a combination of bad weather and improving German defences meant that only light damage was inflicted further on the ships. Mostly, unluckily, on the Gneisenhor, which would end up in dockyard hands a total of four times during its stay after the initial repairs had been completed. However, casualties amongst personnel in the barracks ashore were becoming concerning, enough that for a time they were actually moved out of the town at night, and some of the more experienced crew were taken overland to man other ships and replaced with new recruits who would train on the ships in port whilst they were being repaired. Additionally, the dock gates were damaged by a bomb hit at one point, which trapped the Scharnhorst in dock whilst they were repaired. The surrounding dock area and the town were starting to do a creditable impersonation of the moon, and as 1941 turned into 1942, it was clear that the longer the ship stayed, the more chance there was of yet another hit setting back their ability to sail. And the next big AP bomb hit might not be a dud. It was at this point that salvation came from the most unlikely of sources. Proving that even a completely mad broken clock can still be right twice a day, the ship's saviour would be none other than Adolf Hitler. Through, through a combination of 11th dimensional thinking and luck, provided the basis of one of the most audacious plans in history, although in typical Hitler fashion, for almost all the wrong reasons. You see, the German naval high command preferred to send the ships out into the Atlantic and back up through the Denmark Strait, back to Germany via Norway a route that a number of ships had managed before. However, this was now a plan fraught by considerable risk. The British were watching Brest like hawks, and would easily be able to get heavy units of the home fleet to cut the Germans off in a second battle of the Denmark Strait, long before the Germans could get there. So Hitler suggested that they should go up the English Channel. Grand Admiral Raider said this was impossible, for many good and valid reasons. The British would still spot them leaving. British intelligence would be sure to find out about the preparations and intensify bombing before the ships left, and would have everything waiting for them. 
The channel was covered with hundreds of aircraft, dozens of destroyers, submarines, motor torpedo boats, radar aircraft, shore-based radar, shore gun batteries, minefields, and other such fun things. Sending the ships there would be utterly suicidal against a primed British defence effort. Further, the bombing of Brest was diverting hundreds of RAF bombers from the German industrial heartland. And finally, they could still do considerable damage commerce raiding if they were based on the French Atlantic coast. Hitler responded that clearly the solution was to tell nobody, not even the ship's crews, what was going to happen. Then, wait for a spell of bad weather, when RAF recon aircraft couldn't see the port without flying low enough to be shot down, and then send the ships out without warning or training, and just make a run for it. He further reasoned that the RAF would switch back to bombing Germany once the ships were inevitably badly damaged, and that in any case, the ships were needed, along with uh, Tirpitz, Hipper, Lutzow and Scheer, to form a powerful fleet for defence against the inevitable Allied invasion of... Norway. Yep, Hitler was utterly convinced that the Allied plan was to launch a counter-invasion of Norway, and then march their armies across it into Sweden to cut off Germany's supply of raw resources. The only problem with that being that nobody in Allied High Command had a serious consideration of doing so, possibly in part because it would end up with them sharing a land border with Finland, and they'd all seen how well that went for the USSR a few years ago. Plus, the whole trying to supply hundreds of thousands of men and tanks in some of the most inhospitable terrain in the world right in the path of every U-boat Germany could muster kind of factored into their thinking a little bit. But, convinced that an allied Nazi Ragnarok was a thing, Hitler ordered that the plan be made and Vice Admiral Otto Silax decided to humour the Führer with a plan that had the ships leave at night and pass through the narrowest and most heavily defended part of the channel, the Straits of Dover, in broad daylight. He further pointed out that the Luftwaffe would need to provide at least 250 fighters to hold off the RAF. The Luftwaffe promptly refused, citing the fact they didn't have 250 operational fighters in northern France on any given day, period, let alone be in a position to guarantee combat operations from them all in one place to the exclusion of practically everything else. Hitler, of course, declared that he loved this plan, and they'd do it anyway, and he'd blame the Luftwaffe if they couldn't conjure up the requisite aircraft, oh, and also Admiral Silex, since you're the one who came up with a detailed plan that shows how brilliant my idea is and how it will work, you get to be in charge of it all. I'm sure he was thrilled. However, Silax was not an officer to let a small thing like apparently impossible tasks deter him, and he set about making the best of the situation. He worked closely with Admiral Saarwachter, overall commander of the Western Naval Operations, to ensure every possible chance to make this work was taken. Destroyers and torpedo boats were sent the other way to Brest to provide an escort screen, U-boats were taken off offensive operations to serve as mobile weather reporting stations. The best route to steam at high speed was plotted, and minesweepers were sent out to clear routes through known British minefields, where they overlapped with the preferred route. Even things like the cycle of the moon were noted to identify the longest possible period of darkness, and the sailing was planned around a spring tide coming up the channel, which would give the ships a little bit more speed, and possibly even lift them over any mines which the minesweepers might have missed. Torpedo boats, destroyers, S-boats, R-boats, and random small craft left over from the abortive Operation Sea Lion were stationed along the coast of France. Every part of the Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe that wasn't in Brest practiced their roles, and the ships themselves ran trials in the harbour approaches. Everyone in the town could tell that the ships were leaving. And so, tropical helmets were brought aboard, and the locals were ordered to carry mysterious packages labelled for use in the tropics aboard, since obviously neither the channel nor the waters near Iceland were especially warm. Clearly, they couldn't possibly be going anywhere near there. The Luftwaffe at this point was still refusing to play ball completely, however but someone decided to lump Adolf Galland with command of the air operation, and he decided to work with Luftflotte 3, 
and mobilizing their training units to make up the numbers, since large numbers of that particular formation's fighters had been diverted to the campaign in Russia, which was why the fighter numbers were so much lower than they had been the previous year. He also worked on new jamming techniques, which were tried to knock back the range of British shore-based radar, and specially equipped Dornier 217s would further the electronic countermeasures efforts. He even managed to persuade Flieger Corps 9 to attack RAF bases to try and reduce the number of nearby aircraft that would be available. A rolling system of fighter patrols was established to ensure that between 16 and 32 fighters would be over the ships at any one time. Overall, it was an impressively detailed amount of work to put into something that most of the officers involved were pretty sure would fail spectacularly, and for a great number of them, probably fatally. The British, on the other hand, had not been idle. Mad and suicidal sailing up the channel may be, but the British were not exactly strangers to making the mad and suicidal work, and so they were prepared for such an attempt. Rather than risk everything on a single throw of the dice, they planned a massed, continuous assault to wear down the Germans and basically create so many chances to do damage that statistically something would have to get through. To this end, submarines were stationed off the coast of Brest, followed by no less than five trip lines made up of patrols of radar-equipped recon aircraft, plus the coastal radar arrays. The idea was that once detected, dozens of motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats would launch a mass torpedo assault, followed up by waves of light and medium torpedo bombers, then the heavy coastal batteries, and then the mass strikes by bomber command on anything that was left. Assuming that anything flying the German flag was still intact, new waves of destroyers, bombers, and mine-laying aircraft would hound the Germans into the North Sea. A hundred bombers and more than two dozen fighter squadrons were on standby alongside Royal Navy and Coastal Command torpedo bombers, and constant efforts were being made to reinforce the minefields and lay new ones, and this was being undertaken by multiple aircraft as well as specialist mine-laying cruisers. It looked, therefore, like the British had done everything possible to counter any German operation, preparations or not. As February 1942 arrived, despite their best efforts, the German plans began to become apparent, thanks in part to the cracking of the Enigma codes by Bletchley Park, which noticed that Silax had boarded Scharnhorst, and minesweepers were sweeping the channel. This, combined with recon photos, showed that the ships were in the water, not in dock, and that they had increased numbers of escort craft. Clearly, something was about to happen. Just in case the Germans made for Italy, for whatever reason, the battleship Rodney, as well as the entirety of Force H, were ordered into the Atlantic from Gibraltar. On the 10th of February, torpedo bombers were moved closer to the coast, and Bomber Command moved up to two hours' notice from their previous four hours. The submarine HMS Sea Lion moved in to close watch on Brest, and a cracked communication that made reference to captured charts gave away the route. Everything was therefore primed to make this operation the worst naval disaster in Kriegsmarine history. And so, on the 11th of February, as the sun went down, Operation Cerberus began. HMS Sea Lion is waiting outside Brest Harbour. The German forces are supposed to set sail at sunset to give them maximum time in the darkness. Then the RAF shows up. Right, chaps. There's plenty of jerry boats down there, even more than last week. Let's send them some explosive presents, shall we? Ought to keep them bottled up for a bit. Come on, there's so many down there we can't possibly miss them all. Well, we can't sell out right now. They'll see we're leaving. Keep the flag batteries firing. Huh. Looks like they missed us all. Okay, bring in the torpedo nets and let's get moving. We're running late already. HMS Sea Lion, seeing nothing but some pretty explosions, heads back out to sea to recharge its batteries. 
Meanwhile, a British agent in Brest is frantically signalling imminent German departure. But the Germans are jamming all the radio frequencies and his message can't get through. The fleet assembles offshore, unknowingly close to the path of Patrol Stopper, a radar-equipped Hudson bomber that is the first of the five airborne tripwires. <laughs> I wonder where he thinks he's going. The first aircraft is already southwest of the fleet as it heads north and heads further out to sea. Despite a radar range of 13 nautical miles, the next aircraft flies by within 9 nautical miles without noticing anything. Screen's all clear. I guess Jerry's staying put for the night. Probably can't find his way out of port. Terribly frightful weather this is. The fleet approaches a line southeast, the next tripwire. Only, there's no aircraft there. Damn, the blasted radar's on the blink again. Best head home, the chaps over west haven't seen anything anyway. The fleet is still west of Patrol Line Harbour, which is still operating normally. At their rate of advance, they're going to be detected soon. Message from Control, lads. Fog's predicted back at home soon. We've been called to land before it really sets in. You can't land these old crates blind. It's really quiet out here. Where did everybody go? Firing off recognition flares and dipping their wings in salute, the first of Gallen's fighters roar over the German fleet before streaking skywards to begin their daytime vigil. Good mom, my template friends. We will keep you safe from the British Wackites. RAF radar notices four German aircraft circling over Le Havre, taking them at first to be air-sea rescue craft. Meanwhile, the Dawn Patrol by fighters, the fourth tripwire, flies from Ostend to the mouth of the Somme, but still finds nothing. The German ships are still too far to the west. The RAF operators notice something a little bit odd. Those rescue aircraft? They've been hanging around for an hour and a half and have been moving northeast gradually, about 25 knots. That's either one bloody persistent swimmer who doesn't want to be rescued, or something is wrong here. Better send a couple of Spitfires to check it out. RAF Fighter Command receives word that radar jamming started up an hour ago, and that coastal radar stations were detecting a formation of surface ships. Meanwhile, in the air. Yep, certainly some jerry boats down there. But do we want to let on we can see them? Hmm, better not. I'll tell the boss when I get back to base. Tally ho! Oh, some British are planes at last. No, over here you half blinded fool in a message mid. <sighs> now they're getting away. Goring will give any idiot the keys to a plane these days. No wonder they didn't send that one to the Eastern Front. It's nice and sunny up here. Round and round in circles we go. God, I hope I don't get dizzy. Two other RAF pilots had randomly decided to shoot up German bases in France today, and happened to stumble across the oncoming fleet on their way over to the French coast. I say, that's an awful lot of Germans. Pity we can't sink a battleship. Wait a minute, there's a couple of fighters over there. Let's have a crack at them. Take this, you crazy crowd! Oh, hello there. Nice to see you. Let me introduce you to the rest of the squadron. Crikey! There's a few more than I thought. Best be off. Let's hope they don't follow me through their own ACAC. Yeah! And stay away too! Finally something to do. All flag arms fire! Come on, hit something! Hey, you two ingrates! Leave that schnellboat alone! Come back here and fight me! Okay, fine. Run away. See if I care. The recon Spitfires land and report a German flotilla, and radar stations have now resolved at least two large ships in this flotilla. 
Twenty minutes later, the second pair of pilots land and confirm the sighting in detail. Alarms and alerts begin to spread across the English coast. Unbelievably, as the defence plans finally start to swing into motion, the messages that are going out are telling everyone that not only has the German fleet been spotted, with air cover, but it's already entering the Straits of Dover at the eastern end of the English Channel. 250 bombers are told to make preparations to scramble, but the first 100 are preloaded with semi-armor-piercing bombs, which need to fall 7,000 feet to build up enough speed to work properly, and the cloud cover goes down to 700 feet. The bombs are switched for high-explosive ones. The damage would only be superficial blast effects, but the hope is that this will kill or suppress enough of the anti-aircraft gunners and distract the enemy fighters long enough for the torpedo bombers and motor torpedo boats to make their runs. Crews across the south coast are woken up and mechanics start checking over their aircraft. The German fleet enters the narrowest part of the Dover Straits. 6-inch, 9.2-inch and supercharged 14-inch shore batteries start blasting away, but the mist limits visibility to about 5 miles, well short of the German line of advance. They fire anyway, hoping their new radar set, which clearly shows the German positions, would let them spot the shell splashes as well and correct. Unfortunately, this early war radar is not capable of such high resolutions, and the guns are fired without correction. Haha, <laughs> look at all the pretty water spots. You're over here, dumb cop. I'll send a note to Calais to collect all the fish you're murdering. Towards the end of the barrage, German coastal guns on the French coast also begin a sporadic bombardment of the British guns, offering further distractions. Six Fleet Air Arms Swordfish torpedo bombers set off for the attack, led by one of the officers who'd been part of the strike wave that crippled the Bismarck the previous year. Look lads, we've been up and about for ten minutes, and only one bloody escort squadron's shown up. I can see Jerry from here. Let's make the best of it. Aha! I see you this time. All fighters, take out the escorts first. For the fatherland! Yeah, real smart, because a Spitfire can sink me, obviously. Never mind the bloody biplanes. Do you see what they did to the Bismarck? Flag batteries! Do you see the swordfish? I don't want to! Blighty, I appear to have caught a case of German flak measles. Looks like we're not going to be back for tea and biscuits this time. All the swordfish are destroyed although the Germans were amazed by the ferocious pounding they took before going down, Esmond's aircraft apparently refusing to fall despite being on fire and badly shot up until a large shell, possibly a main gun round from the Scharnhorst, tore almost the entire lower half of the aircraft off. A few torpedoes made it into the water, but were easily avoided. Five motor torpedo boats make an attack run, but find their way blocked by a dozen S-boats. They fire their torpedoes at maximum range and fall back, two motor gunboats holding off a Narvik-class destroyer from attacking the last motor torpedo boat. Two more arrive from Ramsgate a bit later, but are too late and can't set up for an attack run. Several whirlwind fighters, completely unaware of what's going on, run into the German fighter escort and tangle with them. Meanwhile, four Beauforts and their fighter escorts that actually went off to find the Germans get lost, find nothing, and decide to go home. Several formations of Beauforts and Hudsons assemble with fighter escorts. The Hudsons are a diversion to allow the torpedo bombers in to strike. But both groups think that the other group is supposed to be in the lead, and they spend the next hour and a half chasing each other in circles around the airfield, before most of them land as their fuel begins to run low. A few get fed up and head out on their own initiative. The German fleet is passing through a swept channel in a minefield, but the minesweepers have missed at least one. It's so cold and lonely down here. Ooh, a thing. Hello there. 
figures. Of all the things to hit us, it's something we're actually run into. Fortunately, after a short time stopped, they were able to get going again at 25 knots after resetting the Shan Horse electrical system and pumping out some of the water that had put her a metre down by the bows. Admiral Silax transfers to Z29 to keep up with the rest of the operation. Although this is the perfect time to attack a sitting duck, the British pilots are unaware of the situation and instead are going after the main formation some miles ahead. The lost Beauforts are told where they actually needed to look, and two of them head back out. The fed up Beauforts and a few Hudsons arrive sporadically along with waves of heavy bombers. 73 Manchesters, Halifaxes and Stirlings show up in the first wave, followed by 134 aircraft in the second wave. But rain and low cloud obscure the targets enough that only a few dozen actually manage to drop their ordnance, resulting in no hits and the loss of 15 bombers to flak or flying into the sea in the fog, with 20 more damaged. During this period, Scharnhorst fires so many AA guns continuously that the barrels are glowing red hot by the end and one of the 20mm cannons explodes from the strain. Six destroyers of the Nor command have been sailing south for three and a half hours. Now they make radar contact, having had one of their number dropping out due to engine trouble. About ten minutes later they burst out of the mist and are immediately engaged by the Germans. In the middle of all this, the formerly lost Beauforts show up, fly through a confused flak screen and drop two torpedoes, both of which miss. The destroyers press their attack to within 3,000 yards, HMS Worcester taking hits from the German capital ships, but their attacks also miss, although Prince Eugen has to take violent evasive action to avoid an incoming torpedo. The last few Beauforts and 35 more RAF bombers show up in dribs and drabs, but gathering cloud and darkness mean the only hits scored are by continued German flak. Having survived the seemingly random attacks through the day and now under the cover of night, the Germans seem to have a clear run to safety. However, back when the route became clear thanks to the Enigma intercepts, Bomber Command had laid more mines in the swept channel. And now along comes Gneisenau. Bloop! Flooty flooty flute. Hey, a new friend! Offerdam, get that hole plugged and run some pumps down. We need that turbine back online as soon as possible. After about half an hour, the ship was back underway. However, along comes the Scharnhorst. I'm a mine. I'm a mine. What a happy time to be a mine. Hello there, you big strong hull you. Come here and let me hug you. I'm sure we have chemistry. Ja, sagen und für was haben wir eigentlich Minoren? Was machen die den ganzen Tag da drüben? Die saufen doch Bettinge, diese gottverdammt Weißwurstwasser, Steckerleislutscher. Zerfix! After about an hour without engines, steering or fire control, Scharnhorst crawls away at 12 knots. The main armament and most of the 150mm guns are jammed. Gneisenau and Prince Eugen arrive at the Elbe and make to dock, having been diverted from Kiel due to thick ice in the canal. Gneisenau promptly runs into a submerged wreck. You know what? I give up. I'm retiring. The ship is then taken into a floating dry dock. Scharnhorst arrives at Wilhelmshaven, waits for the ice to be cleared, and enters the dock, where it stays for two days before being sent to Kiel for further repairs in another floating dry dock. It may come as no surprise that the whole situation caused a massive uproar in the UK. 
the Royal Navy, fresh from the loss of Prince of Wales and Repulse, had declined to incorporate heavy fleet units in the response plan, despite Germany's torpedo bombers being hopelessly obsolete compared to the Japanese. And the failure of the RAF's level bombers illustrated exactly why such aircraft were practically useless for attacking moving targets, and the RF would come under significant criticism for this decision. Despite the ambitious preparations, a combination of equipment failure, poor cooperation and coordination, and a tactical error in thinking many small attacks could have as much of an effect as a few large ones, had allowed the first successful transit of the Channel by a hostile fleet in over three centuries. For all the brave efforts of the men of the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force that day, they could have all stayed at home and in the end accomplished almost exactly the same thing, since it was the mine-laying efforts days earlier that had done the actual damage. On the German side, Operation Cerberus was hailed as a tactical victory, and Admiral Silax would get a Knight's Cross, a promotion, and be sent to defend Norway. Technically, he did very well in his role, as no Allied invasion of Norway ever sailed into a fjord. In private, though, the Kriegsmarine viewed the whole thing as a bit of a strategic defeat that had been forced on them by Hitler, exchanging a very real threat against British shipping for a notional defence of Norway and confining every major Kriegsmarine unit to the North and Baltic seas unless another run past the home fleet would be permitted. Total British losses amounted to a pair of Blenheims, four Whirlwinds, four Wellingtons, six Hurricanes, ten Hamptons, ten Spitfires, and six Swordfish, plus the destroyer Worcester out of action for three months. Between 230 and 250 men had been killed or wounded. On the German side, torpedo boats Jaguar and T-13 were damaged by the blast of near-miss bombs, and around 20 Luftwaffe aircraft were shot down, with around two dozen sailors and aircrew dead, and a few wounded, along with da the damage to the two Scharnhorst class. Prince Eugen would be torpedoed by a submarine off Norway a few weeks later, and spend the rest of the war in the Baltic. Gneisenau was still in its floating dry dock when the RAF showed up a couple of weeks after its arrival, to show that it was no safer than it had been at Brest. It was due to be refloated in the next few days, and had been restocked with operational supplies and ammunition, so when a single bomb smashed through the armoured deck on the forecastle, fragments ignited charges in her forward turret, and a huge explosion threw the turret off its tracks, and burned out the forward part of the ship, forcing a flooding of the magazines. The damage was so extensive that it was decided to replace the bow entirely, along with the main battery, putting in the twin 15-inch guns they'd always wanted, but by the time the repairs were progressed enough to begin the conversion, Hitler had ordered the surface fleet scrapped after its failure at the Battle of the Barents Sea in December 1942. Although most of the German fleet would escape this fate, Gneisenhau did not, and her existing surviving guns were removed for use in shore batteries. She would eventually be sunk as a block ship and scrapped after the war. Scharnhorst, meanwhile, would be repaired at Kiel, work finishing in July 1942, and after training exercises, a new rudder, and a collision with U-523, she would eventually make it to Norway in March 1943 the only one of the three heavy units in Operation Cerberus to eventually base herself there. As for her eventual fate, well, tune in next week. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.